Thank you very much. Um, it's an extraordinary privilege to come and speak here, it, a privilege to come back to Britain to, to speak, to speak about uh, my book, um, a privilege to be in this room, um, which is, of course, uh, uh, an amazing series of paintings devoted to the progress of science and the useful arts, the progress of man, and those that, of course, is the theme of my book, so it's appropriate. Uh, appropriate to be at the RSA, which, since 1754, has been devoted to the theme of how do we get innovation right and how do we encourage it. And if you go down in the lobby and look at the minutes of the first meeting, you'll see uh, questions of how we could encourage people to do things like learn to draw better and grow madder and refine cobalt. And in each case, they were thinking about non-intellectual property right incentives, prizes, and ways to do this. This is something the RSA has been doing for uh, more than 200 years. Um, I am the Johnny-come-lately on the scene here. I, I should probably be listening to them, not vice versa. Um, thank you also, Bill. Uh, uh, if you haven't read Bill's uh, writings and his blog, you should. Uh, that was great. I have to say, Bill, if anyone is getting an advantage with a member of the opposite sex by saying they've read either my book or Yochai Benkler's, <laughs> they probably need to get out more. Um, so, um, my theme in the book is very simple. I'll sort of give that very quickly so that those of you who want to sort of take a nap in this gorgeous space can do so, and then you can wake up at the end and know, know everything that I had to say, which is um, that for the last 50 years, we have been expanding intellectual property rights in ways that are unwise, that we have failed to understand that the public domain, the realm of material that is open for all to, to share, to reuse, uh, to, to, to repurpose, to remix, that that is vital, as vital to creativity, more vital to creativity in many ways than the special realm we cover with intellectual property rights, copy, copyrights, patents, and trademarks. That we have the balance between the public domain and intellectual property wrong, that we're making our policy quite strikingly without any evidence. Until recently, the World Intellectual Property Organization had no economists of any kind studying the effects of the policies they were putting forward. Imagine having, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States going, let's set particulate emission limits. What number sounds good to you? 500. Okay. That sounds great. How about making it lower? Okay. That actually, come to think of it, was the way that they said yeah, <laughs> policy during the Bush administration. But, but one, one, one does hope normally that policy is made slightly differently. I mean, it really is remarkable. There, if you go to meetings, and sadly I do, hearings about intellectual property rights and how large they should be, how long the copyright term should be. It is a remarkable exception to find anyone saying, I have empirical evidence that this would be beneficial. That's not what the debate's about. The debate is about faith. More rights means more innovation, right? Rewards to creativity. And there are some exceptions. Uh, many of them, interestingly, located in the UK. The, the Gower's Review of Intellectual Property being one of the, the most interesting ones, although sadly, the, Government appears to be um, wanting to uh, ignore it, but that's some, for a subject for later discussion. So that's the thesis of the book. We've got this balance wrong, and it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing for our culture. It's a bad thing for our science. Um, it's, a, it's a subject that citizens in a democracy need to be informed about. This is uh, something that should be a matter for democratic debate, not something that should be made by a few technocrats or a few industry representatives. And there are some very simple things that we can do. Uh, to make dramatically better policy. And actually, and I'll talk about this at the very end, there's some reasons for extraordinary optimism if we get things right. Uh, that's the thesis. But um, I thought I'd try something a little bit different in putting forward this thesis, rather than sort of moving in the Germanic style from proposition to proposition linked by tightly woven syllogisms. Um, I thought I'd give you a set of um, images uh, from the book and then pull them all together at the end. So hopefully, we'll see if this works. Um, the first uh, question is, uh, first set of questions is a test, a test I want to administer to all of the people in the audience. Um, some of the people in the audience are actually too young for the test to work, but they can just sort of laugh at their, their elders while it's going on. 
So I've taken you back to 1992. And you have to decide between two different kinds of networks in which this world computer communications thingy is going to be built for the future. Um, network number one looks sort of like a global version of Minitel or CFAX, uh, a state-controlled or privately controlled network with a bunch of terminals that do five or six or eight or 13 things with approved sites that connect. So the BBC can provide weather. I cannot provide weather. Um, the BBC can provide news. The Times can provide news. I cannot provide news. I can read what the Times sends, and I can find out what the BBC says about weather, but it's basically that's all I can do. So it's approved sites in a closed network worked by a terminal, and the difference between a terminal and a computer is the terminal just does what it said it was going to do. It's not going to be reprogrammed. It can't be made to do new things. It just does a couple, five, eight, 10, 13 things. So that's network number one. It has all the excitement of old-fashioned BBC broadcasting on Sundays, um, religious broadcasts interrupted by sheepdog trials. Um, but there it is. It's 1992, that's the offer. The second network is described to you um, by some scientists who say, no, there is this thing already out there called the internet, where, where not that many people are using it right now, but it's, it's this amazing system because it's completely open. The network is dumb. The network will take whatever you send it and it will reassemble it. It's distributed. It can't be filtered. Anyone can connect to it. The protocols are free. They're not owned and they're not controlled. And you could do anything with it and you've got general purpose computers sitting at either end and they can be made to do anything that you can come up with. And we think that this will be this amazingly innovative, potentially global, transformative network, let's call it the World Wide Web. So this is clearly a disaster. Anyone could connect to this network, anyone. Idiots could connect to it, check. There could be porn, check. Strangely articulate sons of Nigerian oil ministers would write to you and offer for, I mean, it's so nice. I, I open my bank account to them all the time. It's probably why I have to give lectures. Um, you would um, be offered, many of your body parts could be enhanced. Um, uh, and, and, and you would be informed of that repeatedly by email. Um, who would possibly invest in a network like this, right? I mean, like any commercial company? Are you really saying that commerce would thrive on a non-controlled open network? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, who would possibly invest in it? I mean, in fact, who would ever believe anything on it? Because since anyone could connect to it, the information would be fundamentally unreliable. It would be the same as if, you know, a bunch of monkeys were typing in the words of, insert whichever newspaper you like to make fun of every day, The Guardian, The Times, The Independent. Um, it would just be sort of random sea of noise and chaos and spam and viruses. Oh, did I mention viruses? Yes, people could do malicious things over this network because the openness would allow them to do that. And, you know, disgusting, obscenity, uh, uh, exploitation, all true, right? It's all true. The network is, in fact, used for all those things. The network is, in fact, it has spam, it has viruses, it has porn. And it is because of its openness that it has this. Which network would you have picked in 1992? I personally would have voted for CFAX, Minitel, CompuServe, AOL, not because I don't love openness and liberty, but I mean, come on, this thing could never work, right? I mean, who would ever use it? What could be built on it? Everything could be built on it. Wikipedia could be built on it. I'll talk about Wikipedia more in a moment. Google and Google Maps could be built on it. Thous hundreds of thousands of bloggers, several of them sane, could, be, could use it. <laughs> It could be the greatest democratic flowering of communications in the history of the species. And I personally, and I say this quite honestly, would have voted against it because it sounds insane. Second question. You have to design an encyclopedia. It's 1992. But this encyclopedia has to be better than the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
It has to be in all of the world's major languages. It has to be updated in real time. It has to have a coverage range far beyond conventional encyclopedias. It has to deal with news and events as well as records of prior uh, happenings. It has to cover any subject matter. Again, two people come to you. Number one says, okay, we can build this, it'll be huge. We're gonna need a lot of money, massive capital startup. We're gonna need very strong control over the content. I imagine a strong top-down command model um, based on perhaps the Wehrmacht or Stalin's <laughs> Russia in which Groups of increasingly abused researchers um, <laughs> labor in obscurity to produce nuggets of facts assembled by assistant professors who then write articles that are posted and credited to senior professors who then are signed off on by deans and heads of departments and an editorial board uh, receives uh, magic perks uh, for reviewing it all. Um, and all of this is then strongly protected by copyright, digital rights management. The trademark is aggressively uh, protected. The Encyclopedia Boileania is the mark of authenticity in the 21st century world. I mean, only with that degree of money, enormous amounts of money, that degree of control, massive amounts of control, that degree of closedness. You can't just copy this. We need the money to pay these researchers, to pay these writers. Only that way could we build the greatest encyclopedia the world has ever seen. The second guy stands up and goes, I'd like to put up a website and people could like post stuff, you know? And he sits down again. <laughs> Which would you pick? Now, Jimmy Wales doesn't talk like a valley girl. And um, <laughs> Jimmy, if you're listening, sorry. Um, and his pitch would be more um, eloquent than that. But I mean, come on, seriously. How many of you would have voted to believe if you're let's say, whatever pension you have left, depended <laughs> on this, your correctness of your pick, which would you have picked? Come on, be honest. How many of you would pick number two? No one would pick. Yeah, we'd pick number two. Okay, congratulations. Um, I think you're in the minority. Uh, I certainly would have had doubts. Um, third and final example, I'll keep this one very brief, um, software. Um, imagine that uh, someone is telling you that they want to create uh, amazing software, software that will rival um, uh, anything on the market and exceed it, software that is going to be adopted by major companies across the world, indeed uh, built by major companies across the world, software that the National Security Agency is going to rely on for its encryption, that your digital uh, video recorder is probably going to run on, that your plane, indeed, uh, your plane's navigation may run on. And the person's idea is to say, yeah, we don't want to do this with copyright and corporate control and so forth. We want to have an open source system where anyone can add to the software provided that they make their uh, contribution available back to the commons. Um, and we won't control copying. Copying can be free. That, that's clearly not a sustainable model, right? I mean, that can't survive at all, right? Linux is economically irrational, or so it seems from 1992. My point about these three examples is we have a bias, most of us have a bias, against openness. We see the dangers of openness and they are real. Let me be very clear about this. There are real dangers, real downsides to openness. Extremely well, we see those dangers well. We see the benefits, the upsides to openness, to open networks, open methods of production, open methods of assembly, we see those poorly. We have 2020 downside vision. We see the downside brilliantly, the upside not so much. This is a bias that we should be aware of because we are making our cultural and scientific policy in its thrall. Pilots are trained not to rely on their inner ear when they fly in heavy cloud because otherwise you end up flying straight into the ground. You become disoriented. This is well documented. You're trained to overcome your inherent bias. You're trained to rely on the instrument, to rely on the inclinometer. We need an inclinometer. We need a way of understanding why it is we don't get 
the kind of property that, gets, that lives on networks. We don't understand it intuitively. Our intuitions are wrong. We're like a person brought up in free fall trying to catch a cricket ball in gravity. We lunge to the wrong place. Why? Because our experiences with property are built on things like this. I have this and you can't have it. Right? While I have it, you can't have it, you can't share it. E equals MC squared is not like this. Right? MP3 file is not like this. These are goods which, for better and for worse, work in a different way. That doesn't mean they don't ever have to be controlled. That's not what I'm saying. But we will systematically overemphasize and over-exaggerate the degree to which they have to be controlled. That's my claim. It's a bias. It's not 100% wrong. It's just a bias. That's the first story. Second story. So I live in the United States now. I grew up in Britain. Uh, both countries have and are proud to have a strong uh, tradition of freedom of speech and of expression. True, the legal expressions of those traditions are different. The First Amendment is not the same as the Convention on Human Rights. But nevertheless, there are powerful traditions in both countries. In the 1970s in the US, and different periods in the UK, uh, a series of laws were passed, which were in effect the greatest uh, examples of censorship in the history of democracy, and no one noticed. No one noticed, though we notice when a single blogger is told to take something down, when a single columnist is fired by a newspaper, when a single controversial sex ed uh, manual is withdrawn by the education department. They have free speech, we cry, free speech. But nobody noticed. What were these rules? These rules were the rules of copyright term extension. Um, if you had lived in the United States as of, let's say, 1972, 1973, you would have lived in a world in which copyrights were granted for 28 years. And then after 28 years, you had to choose affirmatively to extend those copyrights. It wasn't particularly onerous to do so, and it didn't cost very much, but you had to choose. 85% of copyright holders didn't renew. 85%. So imagine what the public domain, the world of material free for all of you to use and share would have looked like if we had those rules today. Imagine 85% of all culture produced before that time, say the 70s, right? And play the timeline back, you can, you can do the math, right? Imagine all of that being in the public domain. 85% of all the songs produced, of all the movies produced, of all the books produced. Pick your favorite genre, jazz, film noir, right? painting, whatever it is, you think of it. And imagine that 85% of the time, it varied across uh, cultural forms, but 85% of the time, people didn't renew. Why? Because it wasn't worth it. The book was no longer in print. It wasn't commercially available. Why bother? Right? There was no point going out and renewing the copyright. And so the work went into the public domain. And it was available for anyone to use or share or to remix or to make into a new version or to work their own magic on, to make a derivative work in the same way that we can do that with Shakespeare and Mozart and those other hacks who reside in the pub public domain, that dustbin of history. So how is our world different? If you walk into the British Library or the Library of Congress, you will confront an entirely different world. Copyright terms have been extended and they have been made automatic. There's no need for renewal. Now copyright light lasts for life plus 70. In the United States, effectively, almost nothing is in the public domain that was produced before 1923, not 1975 or 1980 or 1990, but 1923. So all of the culture from 1923 to 2008 is at least prima facie copyrighted. And much of it is commercially unavailable. So even though you want to buy it, you can't. In the case of films, the overwhelming majority of it is not just commercially unavailable, it's a so-called orphan work, which means you don't even know who the copyright holder is, or there are so many copyright holders, you can't clear copyright. 
For books, the orphan works position is not quite as bad, but there's still a lot of orphan works. And then, of course, we also, this is a brilliant one, made copyright automatic on fixation. This isn't fixation like staring at a film star and becoming obsessed. This is fixation like fixing in material form. As soon as he finishes typing his notes, they are copyrighted. That means that every home movie and every photograph and every diary entry, those are also copyrighted for life plus 70. What does all of that mean? It means that of the Library of Congress, the vast majority of it is A, commercially unavailable, and B, under copyright. And that means we can't digitize it, make it available. And in the case of movies, they won't even show you the movie unless you're a, a credentialed a researcher. And meanwhile, of course, the movies are crumbling to dust because they're made on nitrate film. This is a cultural disaster of incredible proportions. It is a, a law restricting expression. I'm not allowed to do an adaptation of this play, to sing that song, to perform that symphony, to show that uh, movie and remake it. I think that's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that we chose for no particularly good reason. I would much rather that we gave those few uh, copyright holders whose works are still commercially valuable after 28 or 56 or life plus 50 or life plus 70 years. We just took a big heaping pot of money from the general tax revenues and said, here, here's twice what you're earning on your current copyright. And all the rest of this stuff goes into the public domain where all of us can use it and share it and build upon it. And then you add the internet. And suddenly, all that material could have been available to, made available to the world for free, number one. And suddenly, number two, all of these things that are being created by people are automatically copyrighted, and it's not clear what you can do with them. You certainly can't show that home movie showing the lives of African Americans in the segregated South because you can't find the copyright holder. And when that home movie was in someone's drawer, too bad, didn't really make any difference. You didn't have access to it anyway. But what about when it's posted on a blog? These rules are uniquely badly designed for the world we have, and they give us almost no benefit whatsoever. This is the greatest law restricting speech, in my view, that has been passed in the last 200 years, and it happened without anyone noticing. So to bring some of these together, I think that what we have done in our society is to let the blindness about openness that I mentioned in the first example, it's called, I call it cultural agoraphobia, a fear of openness. The hermeticism, the limited world of intellectual property where we don't think of this as a speech issue or a culture issue or a science issue, it's just some obscure rules that lawyers and content industry executives and drug companies fight about. We've let those rules be carried on as though public debate was not necessary and the results have been disastrous. They have been disastrous. What could we do differently? The good news is there are actually a lot of things we could do differently, and many of them would be relatively easy. I just want to focus on one, and then we'll stop and have some time for questions. The World Wide Web, the technology that was developed in 1992 that I used to spring my three questions on you, developed by academic researchers at CERN, including uh, most notably Tim Berners-Lee, a fellow countryman, I'm glad to say. It was developed in order to aid science. And the openness of the network, Lee saw brilliantly, was the thing that was going to make it work for science. He was right about the first part of the sentence. The openness of the network made it work. People found ways of doing things that we couldn't have imagined beforehand. Matthew was introducing us to the world of Twitter. If someone had come to you and said, do you think people will really be interested in 140 to 170 character long uh, live blogging about current events? I would have said, no, absolutely not. I, I think that's probably still my position, actually. <laughs> the singular of Twitter is twit. Um, <laughs> But the point is we have built things that we couldn't possibly have imagined. The web has become a brilliant source of easy access for 
books, for shoes, for travel, for cultural information, for porn, for all these things, it works brilliantly. It is brilliantly set up. And we are now used to no transaction costs, no hassle. If you, you want the book, I expect it to be there, and I expect to see it. I want to be able to read inside it, and I want reviews right there, and I want to know what other people uh, uh, wrote, who uh, read who wrote this, and I want to see it all now, and I want to be able to buy it with a single click, right? Because two clicks would just be too hard. <laughs> And I want it sent to me reliably in days, right? I want that, and I expect that that's just the way the world works. Here's the irony. The web doesn't work for science that way. It doesn't work for science at all. The web for science is actually much more like Minitel or CompuServe or AOL. Let me tell a story about scientific journals and a current debate about scientific journals, and then I'll, I'll close. So. Um, Researchers in the EU and the US are paid, uh, are funded by um, their governments to do basic science research. Uh, vast amounts of money are, are poured into it and it's money that is extremely well spent. The rewards, the economic rewards are enormous. The rewards in terms of uh, cures for problems, scientific advances are enormous. Until very recently, this may shock you, um, neither in the EU nor in the US was there any requirement that those researchers should actually make their publications, which come from this research, available openly to everyone. They would be published sometimes in commercial journals. They would be locked up. They would sit behind the, uh, the publisher's firewalls, and that would be it. You might be researching rheumatoid arthritis because your mother has rheumatoid arthritis and you want to see what the latest peer review study is and you get a little snippet and it says to read more, $49, right? Click here, you can buy it. If you're in a university, a great university, it's possible you'll be able to go through because the university has spent hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds in order to grant you access. Um, but of course, the people outside that university and, and there are clever people outside of universities, uh, the people around the world who don't have access to this, and there are clever people around the world in not rich countries, have no access. This is hilarious. We, we built the web for science and made it work for porn and shoes and books. Great, that's really funny. But it's not just, you might think, wow, that's ludicrous. Of course we should be able to read it on the screen, the Mark I eyeball reading the article. Of course we should, it's absurd that we it took us so long to introduce policies. Now in the US, for example, a year after publication, the final version of the author's manuscript, not the final printed version, has to be available on the open web. A, year, a, a very generous provision, giving the, the commercial publisher some leeway. But it's not, people don't understand, it's not just the reading. Have you ever wondered why the web works for information when the web is also full of loonies and idiots? I mean, Right? Much of the information online is wrong. Many of the people online are either stupid or really convincingly imitating a stupid person. <laughs> Many of them are malicious or biased. And yet, when you figure out where to go to eat, when you figure out where to go on holiday, when you want to research a topic, I'm betting you turn to Google. How is it that it works? How is it that that technology can give you reliable information when there's so much nonsense out there? The answer is, it's the links, dummy. The links are the second layer that make the web work. It's not the article that claims that the Vikings were really um, descendants of spacemen uh, that you're going to get when you type Vikings into Google. You're gonna get a really interesting site about Vikings some of them assembled by volunteers, really smart, interesting volunteers, some stuff by Wikipedia, some stuff in Norway and Sweden, right? And the guy who thinks that Vikings came from outer space, he's gonna be way down the list of results. Why? It's not because he doesn't repeat the word Vikings a lot, he does. It's not because he doesn't have lots of nifty graphics and so forth, he does. It's because the people who are interested in Vikings and know something about Vikings don't link to his site because he's a loony. The links are the peer review that make the web work. Where are the links for science? There are no links other than the citations at the bottom of the footnote, in the footnotes at the bottom of the page. Scientists invented the hyperlink, we called it the footnote. 
The only difference of the hyperlink is you actually had to go and get the book and go to the page in order to read the cited reference. The hyperlink just automates the process. And ironically, when we built the web for science, we didn't do that because the articles were sitting behind a firewall and you can't get access to them. And so the scientists can't say, compare this result to this really interesting, apparently unrelated result in another discipline dealing with inflammation, even though this person's writing about cancer and this person is writing about rheumatoid arthritis. And so that second layer, that web, the, the layers that you see with Google Maps, that you see with hyperlinks, that you see with blogs, that's never been built. It's never been automated. Imagine what might happen if we could automate it, if we could take the massive data sets that are out there, the amazing amounts of data that is spewing out of every scientific lab in the world, and link it in real time to the assembled, embedded knowledge of the scientific world caught in, not in paper and, and ink, but in binary bits on the open web and linked by hundreds, thousands, millions of distributed researchers in exactly the way that we take for granted in every other cultural aspect of our lives. What could that web for science build? The answer is we don't know because we haven't tried to build it. But I think it could be something astounding. So the good news well, I'll start with the bad news. I'm from Scotland. The bad news is we've been doing some really stupid things. We have been making policy without evidence, without balance. I'm not a person who's against intellectual property rights, but I am against retrospectively extending them for dead people. Um, dead people don't produce again when you extend their copyrights. I've tr you know, we've tried it. It just doesn't work. What we need to do is to build a movement to preserve the public domain, to make people understand that the fights about licensing fragments of rap music and licensing fragments of gene sequences and fragments of code and the movement about cultural uh, hegemony and extension of copyright term is the same as the debates about business method patents, is the same as the debates about open source software. I actually think that world can exist. I think the environmental movement showed us we can transform our image of the world. I think we need an environmental movement for the public domain of the mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, and, and thank you for finishing on, on an up note. Uh, <laughs> Very <the>, un-Scottish. <laughs> but, but appreciated. We will be able to fly with instruments on the open web. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions of my own, using the privilege I have, and then I'll throw it open to the assembled interwebs and also to you guys. Um, first thing is, this is a fine book. It is a book. I therefore imagine it was written sometime in the past, because it takes quite a long time to get pigment on mashed up pieces of uh, paper. And so it was written in the, uh, the Bush-Cheney years. And it's nice to think of them as history. <laughs> How do you think things will be different under President Obama? Um, I think some things will change dramatically and some things not at all. Um, I think there's some hope that patent policy in the United States is going to get dramatically better. Um, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. The patent system was so badly messed up that everybody agreed it was messed up. So, right? Um, there were areas which worked actually relatively well. Um, drug patents were um, produced in relatively standard ways and were applied in relatively standard ways. You can know what a drug patent was, it worked quite well. And areas which were just utterly insane, business method patents, um, some patents over basic diagnostics and so forth. Um, so, I think that the Patent and Trademark Office uh, is going to be dramatically overhauled, and I think the, the overhaul will lead it in a good direction. Um, I think the Obama administration has shown little hints of understanding that you know, openness is good. So they made available all of their uh, transition material uh, online under Creative Commons licenses. Um, of course, once they get into power, it's all in the public domain immediately under, uh, because the Federal Copyright Act requires it. I think in the realm of culture, um, things uh, and copyrights, things aren't going to get better at all. Indeed, they might well get worse. Um, uh, there are a number of reasons for that. The, the simplest and crassest one is Hollywood loves Democrats. Um, 
and if you're getting your copyright advice mainly from Hollywood, um, uh, that's not such a good thing. Not, I should add, because I think Hollywood is wrong about wanting or needing to protect their cultural products, but because in the aim of fixing, optimizing the system for them, they will drag every other copyrighted artifact along with them. That's what they did with the term extension. We want to extend the term of our film. Let's extend the term of everything, right? Um, I would actually would rather we just handed them money. Um, serious, I mean, it really would be a much better policy to just hand them big envelopes full of cash, uh, which is what we do in Chicago. Um, <laughs> so I think better and worse. I think the real question is whether or not um, Obama has some really, really good science people. And I think the science people get the basic problems in the way that we're doing scientific research. And so while I don't think intellectual property policy narrowly construed will dramatically change, I think in the realm of science and science funding, we might see a real renaissance. And so that's, I ration my optimism and that's the place that I'm spending it. But, but that could then be the next great unexpected thing that comes from like, the, like the internet, exactly. Like, like the internet, exactly. Excellent. Well, well thank you. Uh,